Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode, which is 120. Uh, Shocking. Yes, I know. Shock and horror. (laughs) Oh, that's a lot. It is a lot. We've worked hard, Bob. Um, 120, which is titled Conquering the Toxic Narrative Within the Therapy Process. Another wonderful title. Yeah, quite a mouthful. It is. It is. Um, it's very simple, really, uh, in the sense that mostly people that come to therapy, and this is a generalisation I know, but I think it's backed up by clinical experience, have uh, often a toxic narrative from their significant other whether it be parent, foster parents, or, or, or whatever we're talking about. And that toxic narrative, they've taken on as if it was their own. And it destroys self-esteem. It creates anxiety. Um, often leads to depression. And they feel as if they're always telling themselves off. They will report as people who are very hard on themselves. and they haven't separated out what is their own narrative and what they've gained from their history. Yeah. I think this comes up an awful lot in therapy. Mm, That's right. Yeah. I mean, you and your practice must, you know, see this a lot, hear this a lot. Absolutely. I feel like I talk about this constantly. (laughs) Oh, do you? Yeah. But they'll even use the phrases that that internal dialogue uses mm. in the therapy session. Yeah, but I think part of the process in therapy is to help the clients realise that it's not their narrative. Yeah. And they've actually taken it on. Yeah. It's a internalised narrative, but they feel and think it's their own. Yeah, absolutely. And that so, empowers them then. They, they've got a choice then. Well, if they can separate out and understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Then at some point they chose to take that on board. And if they can do that, then they are, can have they have a choice to not take it on board, if that makes sense. Yeah. And usually in therapy, you know, um, the narrative they take on board instead of the toxic narrative so this is a long process. It's often the therapists in the transferential process. So, for example, you. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I see that and I hear that as well, which <clears throat> it's, I don't want to let my ego get in the way sometimes, but sometimes it, it does. You know, a client will sometimes say to me, you know, when that happens, I think, what would Jackie say? Mm. So it, it's kind of like they've got my words as well as that internal dialogue going on. Yeah, so if you think of it that way, um, inevitably, part of the therapy process will be repeating narratives. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah, we ever it, have our own? Do we do we ever replace it with our own, or do we just acknowledge the fact that we have that that doesn't belong to us? Oh no, Jackie. I mean, yeah, people can um, leave therapy in what we could call um, transferential script. In other words, they they leave therapy. And they still do what you have just talked about, which is they hit, they have taken on your narrative, which is far more um, positive, usually, than the toxic narrative that they've got, which has created lack of self-esteem and all the things I talked about. However, 
if people leave therapy with that process, they haven't completed the treatment. Yeah. It's far better, of course, your narrative, a healthy narrative, um, than the one they often come with. But it's still not completed the process as far as I'm concerned. It's a step on the way. So we could look at this at least in a three-stage step. You know, if somebody comes with lack of self-esteem, lack of value in themselves, lack of importance, often feel depressed or low mood, and repeatedly say to you they're hard on themselves, often the one the positive therapist has heard the story, um, it's to help the therapist separate out, sorry, help the client separate out where that internal dialogue has come from or that internal narrative yeah. and to be understand and to get to a place where they can understand what narrative is their own and what narrative is toxic parent that we're talking about here now in that process once they have done that the second part of this process is usually by definition to take on a healthy parenting process if you want to put it that way uh we did a vid video on healthy reparenting i don't know how long ago but to take on your healthy usually the therapist's narrative which is a far better than the destructive nar narrative of the toxic parent yeah the next step which i see is the nearing the end of the final treatment is where they um practice the new narrative which is yours so the client says well under stress when i hear these uh internalized toxic sentence constructions or narrative i now think well what would jackie say and what is that more positive narrative that's a great step in therapy as i say the next one is to really start integrating their own positive narrative uh, in terms of their psychological personality now they can't do that i don't think very straightforwardly without having practiced that with the healthy permissions and narrative from the therapist once they've started integrated that process, then they can start really integrating their own narrative, which uh, will be, I think, the completion of therapy once they've integrated that. Yeah. So they don't go out of therapy in stage two, which is almost like a um, copy of Jackie. Yeah, yeah. So that negative dialogue, will that always be there, though? Because well, I think about, you know, when we're stressed, when we're overwhelmed, when we're tired, when we're ill and all that sort of stuff, we kind of go back to our scripted stuff a lot easier than when we're in top form. OK, so I'm 72, and I recently... I've taken up Pilates, um, you know, for my, you know, my physical health. But also, I've just developed, or it's been coming on a long time, an arthritic um, shoulder here. Yeah. Right? So one of the things the uh, physio said, and the Pilates person said, is that I need to um, not sleep on the right hand side where my 15 and a half stone weight is always on the arthritic shoulder that yeah. makes sense because yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it creates the pain and prolongs it yeah so they both said well try sleeping on your good shoulder which is the left hand side yeah now i've been sleeping on the right hand side i'm 72 probably for 72 years yeah it's habitual, <laughs> yeah. It's hard so to get out of. It's so ingrained yeah. 
that I have tried sleeping on the left hand side and after about 10 minutes I honestly go back to sleep on the right side I've got to a place now where after lots of practice I can probably do half an hour or an hour on the left hand side but eventually but it will take a lot of practice yeah I will be able to change my habit of a lifetime yeah and I think it's exactly the same psychologically yeah this isn't a one off oh you can just suddenly sleep on the left hand side if you've always been doing something for 72 years or whatever it is this, this is a whole process we're talking about yeah Not only the physical level but in the sense of what we're talking about on this podcast at a psychological level yeah and i it, it's a bit like you need to keep your hands on the steering wheel sometimes if we let go we revert back to things so it, I can imagine, you know, I've got a vision of you falling asleep on your left hand side and then waking up on your right hand side. And at some point yeah. in the night, you've turned <clears> over <throat> and back gone back yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, there's good news about that. Good news in all this, even though. You, good. I like good news in a therapy session, Bob. <laughs> it doesn't take 72 years to change it. Yeah. In other words, I hope to have conquered this in about three months so that I don't do what you have had what you've just said that in the morning I wake up on the right hand side because I've you know throughout the night I've moved back again yeah so my favorite saying of all time is going to come out here Jackie love it and that is <laughs> <laughs> therapy is a process never an event yeah so you're absolutely correct that integration changing psychological habits won't just happen you know in six sessions or ten sessions this yeah. will take time the good news as i've said is it won't take anywhere near as much time um i say me 72 years i hope to have solved and not solved it but integrated new ways of being in the next 12 weeks yeah it takes practice yeah it takes proactivity it takes resilience and it takes, um, you know, yeah, into practice really. Yeah, because for me, I think a lot that it's about noticing and awareness is the first thing. Because a lot of I know a lot of my patterns in behaviour are habitual. I don't even think about them. It's not a conscious thing. I just habitually do certain things. But when we pay more attention to it, we notice what those habits are. And it becomes more of a conscious thing rather than a subconscious thing. Absolutely correct. And going to therapy is one way. The therapist will help you become more aware. Absolutely. And I also think techniques like mindfulness. Yeah. Techniques which are about reflecting on your internal processes. Yeah. Will help in the areas of awareness. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. Awareness is very important fact alongside motivation um are the two main major planks that takes people to therapy yeah the I've therapy, been, go on no i'm just saying i've been doing some work with i run a membership based on therapeutic principles and i've been doing some work on them about our values and beliefs and whose values and beliefs they actually are because i think we do inherit an awful lot with yes. that question so I've yeah. been encouraging them to <clears throat> question, you know, who are you? What are your beliefs and values? And are they actually truly yours? Absolutely. Now, I think you said on the last podcast, but you've said, you said what I'm going to say on several podcasts. So I'm going to go back to what I think you said on the last podcast again. I think what really helps that process, what you're talking about, is two chair work and a role yeah. play. When they actually play the significant other in their head yeah they yeah. go back to their younger self and have a dialogue between the two and that helps them really in separating out and helps awareness you know very much quicker so that again have two chair work and have a, a dialogue with who with themselves and their younger self younger self talking to their significant other which perhaps in this case of this podcast 
um, has been the person who's yeah given out the negatives and okay. the negative um, narrative here. Okay. Now, in that conversation, not only does the therapist hear the conversation, but the client themselves becomes more aware because they're externally dialoguing. Yeah. What we're talking about here. Yeah. One of the really, really big losses for two chair take, you know, if you wanted to start practicing it, even if it's role playing, is the increasement of awareness between the two parts of the self. I did an assessment with somebody the other day and she was talking about the two, she was talking about anxiety, but she was also talking about the two parts of the self that were competing in this competitive narrative. Now, I passed on to a therapist, but I hope the therapist does two chair technique at the correct time in the psychotherapy sequence where, you know, she externally plays out or well plays the two parts of the self because that will increase awareness if nothing else yeah yeah i definitely need to grow a pair and start doing some teaching at work i think once you do it i i i talk a lot with clients about having a, a conversation or an interaction with their younger self the, the them of today having a conversation with their younger self. And I suppose that is two chair work, really, isn't it? It is. And I suspect, and I don't know, I'm guessing um, this with you, and I might be completely wrong, but I guess that perhaps instead of doing two chair work, you might do things like, well, go and write a letter to your younger self. Yeah. Go and write a letter back to your yeah, I bet you do things like that. Absolutely. What would the you of today say to the you yeah. when yeah. you were thirteen yeah. or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's a very, it's not a big step then, just to sort tell them to talk to a cushion or a chair and do some role play. Yeah. So I know this is not what we're talking, and we do need to do a full session on this. But do you literally get them to move positions when they're doing it? Absolutely. That is now, some therapists might not. Thing. Yeah, right, okay. Some therapists might not. I think it's important because I believe in the energetic response. In other words, I, I you know, human beings are basically made up of energy. So if they move from one energy place to another, they will feel differently. Yeah. And I've done that in a therapy session when a client felt overwhelmed or really anxious all of a sudden. I've got them to get up and move to a different position. Mm. So I've, you know, I've I've done that, but not the two chair mm. work stuff. It yeah. would be a very small step for you. You'd find it, I think, very important in your practice. And then I also think you'd be surprised that you never practiced it before. Yeah, I'm 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 definitely on the verge, Bob. Definitely on the verge of giving it a go. <laughs> oh, so in terms of this podcast, anyway, I think that particular techniques helps the two things. It helps for awareness and what you are talking about, what you've just talked about. Yeah, awareness being a key to this separating out of you know their own uh, narrative and the, the critics' narrative, and I think that's important. Yeah. Once because, they do that, they're onto a winner. Yeah. One of the other topics that comes up around that internal dialogue with, with my clients an awful lot of the time is that impasse that when our critical parent is having a go at us, we'll often go into our rebellious child and then we kind of keep the cycle going. Mm -hmm. That's something that comes up an awful lot. Yeah, so and the realisation when a client hears that... <laughs> It's like, God, yeah, that's what I do all the time, literally. They they go into the compliant, vulnerable self, or they yeah. go into the rebellious younger self and keep the cycle going. Yeah. So the bit is how they move away to an adult position. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, the the thing I love about transactional analysis is the diagrams that we have to represent this that kind of brings it all together. So I am 
in the I'm, I'm just in the moment of actioning a project, Ooh. which is an educational project, and I'm going to get a filming company in mm. to film me doing some educational videos, and one of them is on contracting, one of them is on um, methods of an integrative psychotherapy, one of them is on running a relational group therapy, and I put down one of them as a parent interview or tour or to chair work. So in other words, I intend to do five educational value videos, which will go on a website, it'll be free, and people can go and watch techniques of a, a psychotherapist that's been around for quite a long time. Fantastic. So you'll be able to see the two chair work in accent when I've done it. Um, but talking to the parental interject or the critic that we're talking about here, I think is a really important part here, mainly again, because the other part of the South is listening on. So if, so if they don't, aren't able to talk to the, you know, critic, then the therapist can talk to the critic on behalf of the therapist or younger self. Yeah. And that, that's the thing I can remember this in our training and observing it and how powerful it actually was that sometimes the therapist challenged that part. And when you said then that the younger self or that other part of us is hearing the conversation and we do internalize it. Mm. It's, it's so, it is so powerful, Bob. That's what I meant at the beginning about how we can, you know, change the narrative of the toxic parent. However, um, in some cases, the adapted child or the rebellious child or the younger self, whatever language you want to use, uh, hasn't got the words or the uh, they've been too hurt to stand up to this toxic parent. That's why nothing's changed. Yeah. And they need the therapist to protect them. Yeah. And often... Um, stand up for them if you like yeah and just by and the client just by hearing that other awarenesses will start happening yeah and somewhere mixed in around that i would imagine that it builds trust and at a deeper level between the therapist and the client as well having the client do that standing up for them or talking for them or challenging for them it, it deepens that relationship as well mm. Mm. that's right oh completely and uh it will be very empowering yeah the client yeah most of the most of the clients who report extreme low self-esteem or report extreme anxiety or report low mood or mild depression are usually the clients that will also report in the same sentence that they're very hard on themselves i know i repeated this earlier in the podcast but i think it's worth a repeat and therefore this is the work the therapist needs to start helping the person to develop a different level of awareness but it's not their narrative it comes from somewhere else and this is so important for them to realize that and the rest will follow from that yeah yeah but, and I, I, I love the fact that you related it to you know the self-worth and self-esteem and all that sort of stuff because sometimes I could be talking about me now, <laughs> to be fair. That internal dialogue kind of keeps putting us back in a box <laughs> instead of us having, you know, the ability to stand in our own yeah, our, so to speak, and to achieve the things that we want yeah. to achieve in life. Yeah. And it's 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 a it's a fine balance, you know. Here's some examples for you. Um, uh, well known violinists, um, well known actors, uh I could go on the list where the parent, yeah, has has um, had this high internal critic narrative, and the younger child 
has had to match up by being perfect or getting things right for the exacting parent. Yeah. That's why I said violin, violinists or musicians or any of the artistic process we're talking about here, where the internal critic, the mother, the father, has been so exacting, exacting on them that um, they, you know, you know, have to please this perfect parent. Yeah. And they turn into parents usually when they grow older, acting, thinking and feeling just like the parent that was to them. Yeah. Now, there's many examples. And of course, unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at this, the parents will say, well, I, I, I'm only doing for the best intentions because we want them to be really successful. We mm. want them to be XXX and you've got to be perfect, you know, to, to really succeed this way. And we're only doing for their best interests. So, yeah. you know, that's interesting. And you usually, again, find out if you start talking to the parental uh, part of the, uh, the client that their own parents were like that with them. Yeah. And then they pass it down to their children. I say that sometimes. Not necessarily in a therapeutic situation, but I do say it with my kids that sometimes I open my mouth and my mum comes out. Yeah. The words that my mum used to say to me, yeah. I find it hard, the rattling round in my head sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Sure. If I had my mother uh, in the room now, who, who's she's dead now and is a highly toxic person for me, but I can hear her saying now, well, I only did it for you, your best attentions and the yeah. best for you, um, you know, uh, XXXX. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have achieved what you have if it wasn't for me pushing you or whatever. Whatever it is, yeah. 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 Uh, the problem is, of course, that is that in that process, the child growing up often loses themselves and their own identity because they um, are programmed to be a certain way uh, and please the parent by adopting what they want rather than what they want. Yeah. Yeah. It is something that I'm looking at with a, a lot of my clients and, and my members in the membership is, you know, for them to look. And it's surprising how many of them say, I don't actually know. Who I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly who I am. And it sounds such a ridiculous comment to come out with. But, you know, I'll say, well, what, what brings you joy? What lights your soul up? What makes you happy? And they honestly struggle to find an answer. They don't actually know. Well, if they've got an overwhelming parent taking up all the energy in the psychological space, yeah, usually not much space for the younger self to explore, to have a sense of spontaneity, yeah, to understand what they actually want. And again, it's that habitual behaviour, isn't it? We don't really slow it down enough to pay attention to it. It's just, well, we've all, I've always done this, but do you enjoy doing it? I've never the, really thought about it. Who sent you those messages in the first place? Yeah. It usually comes, as I say, if you trace this back, the messages, the patterns may go back generations. Yeah, yeah. A bit like a hot potato. I so, remember that actual phrase yeah it's a hot potato and it's just passed through generations yeah and the clients need to stop it yeah them to enhance their own sense of who they are in the world so self-esteem grows yeah depression ceases anxiety is replaced by relaxation yeah contentment yeah because when we're only trying to please ourselves and not this imaginary thing in our head life does become so much easier <laughs> you know we it's not that we get it right all the time we're not going to get it perfect we'll make mistakes but there are our mistakes and that's that's absolutely fine as long as we're not harming anybody else well let's put another dimension in this podcast a freud who was the let's say the godfather of psychology all these years ago not necessarily psychotherapy but certainly the creative psychoanalysis came up and wrote in, I think it was the book Hysteria, a long, long time ago, 100 years ago or whatever, said that we, and he meant it metaphorically, we often marry our parents. 
Oh, God forbid. Yeah. <laughs> now, so when we marry our parents, do we just replace one for the other? Or do we replace one with totally the opposite of the other? Yeah. Or, you know, it's an interesting because when you look at it that way, uh, and for people listening, perhaps are couples therapists, will really know what I'm talking about here. I, when you were saying that, I've got an imagination now that there's there's probably eighty or ninety percent of the listeners going, "OMG, that's <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I've done." Either the complete opposite or somebody very similar to them. Yeah. Yeah. The good news is that if the partners or husbands, wives, or significant others, if they love and care enough for you, um they'll stay with you in this process of change. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I often say that to clients when we're talking about communication and couples problems or whatever it is. And if they care enough about you, they'll stay with you. Through the process. Work, yeah. yeah, this process out. Yeah. But it's an interesting one to think about, especially for couples therapists. Yeah. And to look at how the scripts may interlock between the two partners. Yeah. Absolutely. See, that would be a good podcast. How to how to resolve interlocking scripts within the therapy process, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you where you would start. First of all, you help two people become aware of that, but the healing will be many, many generations back. Not in the present. No. Which is a really interesting thing. Yeah, therapy is all about how the past affects the present. Um, and here we're talking about how we can, you know, help the person have a more enhanced quality of life, really. How they can desensitize, desensitize change or resolve or quieten the internal critic and how to bring their own voice louder yeah i've really enjoyed this one bob that's what therapy is about isn't it yeah yeah and it's really relevant like i said i don't think there's a, a week goes by or a day goes by where this doesn't come up at some point in the therapy room for me yeah I'm sure all the therapists and maybe some clients who are listening will you know really understand what we're talking about i hope yeah me too so Great. Next time, we'll be talking about what do you mean by relational therapy or what is relational therapy? That's a big question, especially in 19, especially in 2023. Yeah. So until next time, Bob, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.